Connery clashing with Detective Lawrence Fishburne over a condemned killer in Just Cause. A 1970s TV hit returns in the Brady Bunch movie. Plus a look at the surprises among this week's Oscar nominees. Sean Connery defends a black man on death row for a murder committed in a small southern town in Just Cause, a new thriller that's one of the movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with the Brady Bunch on the big screen, also the first interactive movie, which we both field tested, and our annual recap of Oscar nomination surprises, including the snubbing of Hoop Dreams. You might have heard we're ticked off about that. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times, and we're plenty ticked off, but we'll get to that later. Our first movie is Just Cause, and for the first hour, this looks like a perfectly reasonable drama about a man condemned to death row and the law professor who becomes convinced that he's innocent. Well, that's the first hour. The second hour turns into a wild and unbelievable ride through surprise revelations, plot reversals, an action so contrived that at one point, Sean Connery is all but wrestling with an alligator. As the movie opens, he's come down south to Florida to meet a prisoner convicted of the kidnap, assault, and murder of a little girl. The condemned man is played by Blair Underwood. No, Grandma ain't too busy. A man be coming all the way from Harvard just to see me and give me his time. But praise God, here you is. Please. Now, if I really talked with that kind of verbal buck and shuffle, be a free man today. The local cop who arrested Underwood is played by Lawrence Fishburne as a hostile man who doesn't much take to northern professors coming down to his small town to upset a murder conviction that everybody is perfectly happy with. Connery discovers that Fishburne has beaten Underwood's confession out of him and tricks him into confirming how it was done. You didn't take it out? Pointed at Bobby L? No, sir. You didn't stick it in his mouth and Play some Russian roulette? No, sir. Then how did I know where to look for it? Then a second lead turns up. Underwood points Connery to another suspect, a serial killer also on death row, who hints that he did it. The killer is played by Ed Harris in a role that owes a lot to Hannibal Lecter. Did you kill her? I ain't gonna tell you if I killed that little girl or not. Even if I did, how would you know to believe me? Killing is easy for me. How hard do you think lying is? Now, up until the midpoint of Just Cause, I was paying a certain amount of attention to this movie because it seemed on track as a character study. Then, suddenly, the plot goes berserk. It's not that I objected to reverses and surprises on principle. It's just that this movie seemed to be jerking me around with arbitrary and lurid developments that were shoveled in for their own sake. And finally, I just stopped caring. I think that was about the time that everybody wound up in the alligator hunter's shack. Well, I will tell you that the conclusion of the picture doesn't uh, do anybody any no. uh, favors. Uh, I enjoyed it as a character study. I thought Connery was really very good. I know it's, it's the, the gunslinger coming back for one last shootout. <laughs> I mean, th that story creaks along. But then, the two guys, Underwood and Fishburne, well, they really liven things up. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you're absolutely right that it's sort of the, the wheels go off at the end, but up until that point, I'm giving it a marginal recommendation. So you do recommend this movie, uh -huh. because I, I do. do not, and I the don't. reason is the movie just let me down very, very seriously. Only at the end, I'm saying, come on. I mean, I, if they respected the craftsmanship that yeah. they put into this character... Yeah, the three characters. And all the work, yes, and all the work that those actors put in, then yeah. they shouldn't have had... Wrestling this with the bargain alligators. bargain basement ending. The yeah. wrestling with the alligators is bad, but up until that point... <laughs> Pretty good. That's a great line. I'm going to remember that line. You're good. I'm sure you remember a lot of things I say. 
Okay, next movie, and our next movie is Billy Madison, the latest entry in the Dumb and Dumber American movie sweepstakes with Adam Sandler, opera man from Saturday Night Live, playing the often drunk heir to a big fortune who makes a bet with his exasperated dad if he goes back to school and can pass grades 1 through 12 in just six months, he can take over dad's firm and keep it out of the hands of a jerky executive. And so we see such dismal scenes as this. Adam Sandler as Billy Madison throwing dodgeballs real hard at little kids. Oh, yeah! Those kids look like they're getting hurt. And then there's his come on to his beautiful third grade teacher, nicely played by newcomer Bridget Wilson. Okay, so let's all open up our reading is fun books to page 69. 69. <laughs> now she and Billy do hit it off inexplicably and play a history test version of strip poker. Magna Carta. 12, 15. Other than his drinking problem, Billy Madison doesn't explain why Billy acts like such a jerk so often. But then again, a decade ago, Stripes didn't have to explain why Bill Murray acted the fool in the army. My problem is that Murray's fool made me laugh. Adam Sandler's made me wince and want to leave the theater. Am I getting older or do I have taste? I think I have taste. Billy Madison is pretty late. I think you have taste too, Gene. You know, every once in a while a critic is forced to go back and reevaluate his, uh, his track record. Yeah. And after seeing Billy Madison... Oh, I know what you're going to say. ...and Jerky Boys, Dumb and Dumber is beginning to look more and more like Citizen Kane to me. <laughs> well, Dumb I and mean, Dumber is a good I, picture. I, I should have rated Dumb yes. and Dumber a little higher to have more room underneath to shove these other pictures in. Adam Sandler has a problem, and that is... He's not an attractive screen presence. No, he, he might have a future as a villain or as a fall guy or the butt of a joke, but as the protagonist, his problem is that he recreates the fingernails on the blackboard syndrome. Kind you of can't obnoxious. stand him. Yeah, he's obnoxious. Yeah. And uh, really, you don't have a good motivation for the character's behavior. Uh, they didn't even get to that none, level none, in the writing none. at all. When we come back, they're out of their 70s time capsule and into a big screen adventure. The Brady Bunch movie is next. Marsha did it again. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Oh. Oh. Do we always have to walk so close? Oh, oh yeah. They were a favorite TV family from the 1970s, and now the Brady Bunch is back again in a movie. But instead of making it an extension of the television series, the Brady Bunch movie picks up the Brady's lock, stock, and hair curlers and transplants them into a very different decade, the 1990s. Many of the better moments in the movie involve the rivalry between the glamorous older sister, Marcia, and her jealous younger sibling, Jan. See, Jan, I told you they were mine. Now put them back and don't forget to close the drawer when you're done. She has every right to be mad. They are her socks. But why does Marsha get all the socks? Shelley Long plays Carol, the mom, in a parody of cheerful 1970s chic right down to her absurd hairdo. Mom, can I borrow your car today? I want to ask Donna Leonard to go out for a soda after school. All right, but no hot rodding. The plot involves a $20,000 bill for real estate tax. If the Bradys can't pay it, they'll be evicted. So they stake everything on a talent contest for the $20,000 first prize, and they do their act right out of the 70s. The wheels are humming, the guitar's drumming, and the radio is blasting, and good sounds are coming as we're flying down the highway in a makeshift Model T.A. There's nothing dramatically wrong with the Brady Bunch movie, but somehow it never really takes off. I like the way the director, Betty Thomas, creates a laid-back, sunny mood for the family. Even in crisis, they keep their cheerful dispositions. But maybe there should be more of a contrast with the 1990s world outside. This much niceness needs more rudeness as a comic contrast. I guess what I'm thinking of here is a plot where the Bradys are surrounded by Wayne's World. Well, you know, Wayne's World was the, uh, the best one of all of these yeah. TV transformations, and that was just a sketch mm -hmm. that was built into a whole picture because they created a whole world here. It's just set decoration. Yeah. I think it's the same thing with the Flintstones. They put a lot of attention into how everything should mm -hmm. look and not into anything that anybody says. Nobody yeah. really in the whole course of the picture says anything funny where there's a big laugh out loud. You've got you know, the one you're little, right. You've got the one. orange for a mic a kid. Kitchen. You've got all of those sure. funny the costumes, ties, the, shirts, the, ties, the ties, the polka dots, and so forth. That's but it. That's where the movie isn't genuinely amusing. No. When we come back, we'll give you a report from the field on the interactive picture called Mr. Payback. Is it a gimmick or is it breakthrough entertainment?
I'd like to give you a very intimate demonstration of our new prototype, Persec Unit. Personal security unit with user selectable pain dispensing modes. I choose which of your senses to attack sight, sound, or touch. That's a scene from Mr. Payback, the first interactive movie. Actually, it's a 20 minute short that is having its premiere this week in 22 cities nationwide. The gimmick? Audiences in specially equipped theaters get to vote a dozen times through electronic handsets for the directions the story will take. The buttheads are out there. Who will Mr. Payback meet next? Mr. Payback is thus somewhere between a movie and a video game, offering up the adventures of an avenging bionic man played by Billy Warlock, who gives the audience such choices as, which way would you like him to pay back a jerk who parks in a handicapped space? Move it means Mr. Payback will dismantle the car. Choosing good excuse means he'll deflate the guy's tires. And if you push the make it legal button, well, that has Mr. Payback shoot the jerk with a dart that paralyzes him, thus legitimately rendering him handicapped. Hey, isn't that entertaining? Votes are tabulated electronically, and laser disc machines up in the projection booth make instantaneous edits as the story unfolds. Spoiler, huh? Buckle up! What did I say? Mr. Payback is dreadful, full of humiliations involving electric shocks to the groin, the beginning of a rape scene, and a school principal being dressed up in a leather harness and spanked with a paddle. Foul language is wall to wall. There are still too many jerks and scumbags taking advantage of their fellow man and getting away with it. Naturally, each one of the kids I talked with after the show in suburban Chicago enjoyed it immensely. And did you like Forrest Gump more or less than this? Um, or is it a close call? Yeah, it's a close call. Do you like the part where the, the, uh, teacher, the principal was hit, where she was dressed up in a leather harness and hit yeah. with a paddle? Yeah, I like that part. That was funny. Yeah. More fun than an average movie or less fun? Really more fun than an average movie. They're charging five bucks to sit through two showings of Mr. Payback so that the audience can choose an alternative storyline, different humiliations, instead of maybe the paddling of the teacher. The second time through another villain, you could see a bad corporate executive get forced to eat a dog dish full of monkey brains. I would have paid twice as much to see Mr. Payback only once. <laughs> you know, Gene, I'm sitting there in the theater next to a little, sweet little grade school girl. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering what she's thinking as she's voting. The sadistic headmistress has the hero handcuffed to the ceiling and the audience is voting, should he be spanked with a paddle, mm -hmm. beaten with a rod, or should they go after his genitals with an electric cattle prod? Mm -hmm. And she's voting for one of these three choices and I'm sitting there appalled. The movie is moronic. It is bathroom humor. It's an insult to the intelligence. But what I want to do right here is say, I think the verdict isn't in yet on the idea of interactivity. Now, this is not a movie. A movie acts on you. Mm -hmm. You don't want to interact with it. You want it to so. act on you. So interactive movies are not movies. No, they're not. But the idea of interactivity probably has some very interesting places that it can go, none of which have been discovered no, by no, no, no. Mr. Payback, but the technology, I think, should not be thrown out along with well, the dishwater, if that's a... Dishwater is a compliment to the artistic yes, mentality it is. of the a people. Yes, a high compliment, make. yes. Yeah. Uh, I felt that my favorite venue in the entertainment world, the movie theater, had been soiled. Yeah. Because, frankly, it felt a little unclean being in there. When we come back, a look at some of this year's Oscar surprises, including the shocking omission of Hoop Dreams. This Siskel and Ebert special report is brought to you by Orville Redenbacher, the first and last name in popcorn. The Academy Award nominations were announced this week, and as usual, there were surprises, some of inclusion, some of exclusion. For me, the biggest surprise in terms of inclusion was the way the independent film category seemed to sweep traditional studio films aside in the nominations. Of the five best film nominees, for example, only Forrest Gump is really an old-fashioned, big-budget star vehicle, and... It was pretty weird. The other nominees were an offbeat independent film, Pulp Fiction, a quirky British import, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and the difficult but deeply moving prison drama, The Shawshank Redemption. Even Quiz Show, at a section of an American cultural turning point, was not a traditional big studio film. By choosing films like that instead of more traditional choices like The Lion King, Legends of the Fall, or Little Women, the Academy voters 
we're opening up the envelope a little, and one of the most revealing facts about this year's nominations is that Miramax Films, the New York-based distributor of independent movies like Pulp Fiction, Bullets Over Broadway, Red, Tom and Viv, and Strawberry and Chocolate, got 22 nominations for its films, more than any of the old-line Hollywood studios. That is... Something's blowing in the wind. Well, I can tell you what's blowing in the wind. We're really seeing American movies move along two different tracks, mm -hmm. and that is the very safe studio productions and this whole renegade independent kind of cinema. I could quarrel with you on whether Quiz Show qualifies as it's a It's marginal, standard. it's marginal. Okay, yeah. but, the, but, uh, but your point is very well taken, that the pictures, uh, that there's a real battle going on here. It has to do with the amount of money that's mm -hmm. spent on a film, and it has to do with where these movies come from audience-centered, remaking old TV shows into pictures like we've been talking about, you know what, or whether you make something out of your heart and mind. You know what this Oscar nomination list uh, really does? I think it's an indictment of marketing theories, because what the big studios are doing more and more is market research in terms of how to recycle formulas and to make last year's hit into next year's movie. And those movies, some of them make money, but they're dead in the water, and the Academy voters know it at nomination time. But I will tell you that you're fighting an uphill battle when a picture like the Flintstones grosses $130 million domestically. The biggest surprise inclusion for me was the seven nominations accorded to Woody Allen's Bullets Over Broadway. Three of its actors were nominated in the supporting categories, Diane Weist as a drunken veteran actress, Jennifer Tilly as the mobster's babe, and Chaz Palminteri as the mobster's henchman who becomes Tilly's unwilling ah. babysitter. It don't say ha. Don't say hi, I added that. What do you mean you added that? You I added are you allowed it, to I do added that? it. We're allowed to add things. How could you just add something? You're allowed you to add that. things. It's called ad living. Moving on now to surprises of omission on the Oscar list. We were both shocked to find out that Hoop Dreams, the Chicago basketball documentary of inner city black lives, was shut out of the best documentary category, not to mention best picture. It did receive a best editing nomination, but the documentary committee continued its shocking streak of ignoring films that are praised by critics, or maybe more important, receive plenty of exhibition in commercial theaters and are endorsed by the public. The 47 members of the documentary committee seems to be saying we'd rather help other films achieve the same kind of prominence. This time they ignored a movie that followed two Chicago boys for five years from eighth grade to their freshman year in college as they follow their dream of playing NBA professional basketball. Derek Zinman's layup pushes Marshall to a one-point lead. Moments later, a Westinghouse foul, and then a double technical puts Arthur on the line with a chance to ice the victory. I talked with two documentary committee members. One gave Hoop Dreams the highest rating possible. The other said he heard that some of his fellow members had trouble with its three-hour running time. If true, it should be noted that the film editors nominated Hoop Dreams for best editing of any movie all year, so it wasn't too long for editors, which may be the ultimate compliment if you think about it, for a three-hour movie. The best thing to come out of the snubbing is that the media is going to spend more time now promoting Hoop Dreams, which opened wider last week. It's now in more than 250 theaters across the country. You take a look. You'll be glad you, you did. You know, Gene, I was talking to Barbara Koppel, who won two Academy Awards a for great her documentary documentaries. great documentary filmmaker. And she said this committee is in love with talking heads and stock footage, and that's exactly what they are, these old-fashioned television-oriented films with battleships bombing the beaches of Normandy while some deep voice says how many troops went ashore. They are not interested in living, breathing documentaries. And there's another problem, and that is the committee that picks these documentaries is volunteers, mostly retired people, not most of them documentarians at all. But they have four hours free, two nights a week for 11 weeks to see 64 documentaries, almost 100 hours of documentaries. And so they go night after night, and they get to know each other, and they chat, and they arrive, and they leave. And until this year, they had a chairman. This year, the woman who was the chairman stepped aside for a year because she had a film that was in the running. Now, what do you know? They nominated it. It's the Stockholm Syndrome. They're so friendly that, of course, they wanted to do her a favor. And every year, if you go back year after year and look at the nominees, you'll find one or two nominees that are fishy because the people that manipulate the committee are trying to get their pictures nominated. This situation stinks. It's rotten. And until the Academy reforms it, they have shame on their name. But, Roger, let me just throw some of their objections back, because I know that they're going to okay. be listening and taking notes yeah. on everything you said. Number one, 
they're going to say uh, that every branch gets to vote for its own work. Yeah, but this branch doesn't. The documentarians don't have a documenta documentary branch. Okay. The next thing they're going to say is you, Roger, and you, Gene, have not seen the 64 films well, we voted I've on. Well, I've seen one of them that they nominated, and nobody smart enough to tie his shoes would feel that that film was better than Hoop Dreams. And that was a pretty good film, and by the way. And it was a pretty good film. It's predictable. They resent success. When we come back, we'll take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. Next. Now, why should we let you in? Well, I spent my life avoiding sin. <laughs> Including gluttony. Roll the film game. Here you are, consuming an entire bag of movie theater buttered popcorn. No, wait. That's light popcorn. New movie theater butter light from Orville Redenbacher. A big, buttery taste. And it has no more fat than other lights. Our mistake. Proceed. <laughs> New Red and Butter's light. It only tastes sinful. Nobody's perfect. Wrong answer. Did uh, my folks get to Disney World okay? Uh-huh. still can't believe they went by themselves. <laughs> They're getting so weird. I think it's cute. Yeah, but you know how they are. Dan will bury his nose in a book. The mom will spend half the day just sitting around. Can't you picture it? They'll have dinner in front of the TV, and by 10, they'll be dead on their feet. Give her off. Hey, I love them. But right now, I bet they're thinking, gosh, this place just isn't the same without the kids. Call 1-407-W-DISNEY and make the dream come true. Returning to this week's new movies, let's recap the films we reviewed on this show. A split vote on Just Cause with Sean Connery defending a condemned murderer. I thought the performances were compelling enough for me to give it a marginal recommendation, but Roger felt it was contrived and lurid, especially at the end. With those alligators, he votes thumbs down. Two thumbs down for Billy Madison, another entry in the Dumb and Dumber sweepstakes. This one starring the annoying Adam Sandler of Saturday Night Live. Two more thumbs down for the Brady Bunch movie, a retread, a boring retread of the 1970s TV sitcom. And finally, two more thumbs down for the dreadful interactive movie, Mr. Payback. So looking at that list, obviously the film to see this week is Hoop Dreams. That's it for this week. <laughs> Next week we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Exotica, a psychodrama set in a nightclub with table dancers, and the revival of Sam Peckinpah's classic western, The Wild Bunch, which has been restored in honor of its 25th anniversary to the original controversial director's cut. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. On Saturday, February 25th, Siskel and Ebert taped their annual If We Pick the Winners special at the Disney MGM Studios in Orlando. The first 50 callers receive two free passes to the park and our show, good only that day. Call now. Finally, a panty that won't go where it shouldn't. A panty that actually stays in place from Fruit of the Loom, clothes that make you feel good. Vicks Vapor Inhaler for fast, effective relief of nasal congestion. Easy to use, easy to carry anytime, anywhere. Take a breather with Vicks Vapor Inhaler. It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly, now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly Beans, try them, you'll love them. Dissolve it, safe, non-toxic, 100% organic, non-abrasive, and non-corrosive. Located in the specialty cleaning section of your favorite store, dissolve it.